All right, so look at lesson one, and we're going to talk about frequency distributions and how to graph them. Now, a frequency distribution is just a fancy word for a table. Okay, so I'm going to make a table of a data set. Because what I want to do is try to figure out a pattern for my data set. Okay? So if I want to figure out a pattern for my data set, let me give you a data set. And this is just going to be a random list of numbers. Don't really worry about at this moment what it represents. But later on, we'll put some meaning to it. It could be something as easy as age, height, weight. It could be a grade for an exam. It could be something like uh, blood pressure. It could be temperature. Anything that you want to measure by a number, this is what we're going to use. So I'm going to make a data set, and it's going to have the following random numbers. One, two, four, five. Five, two, three, three, and four. I should have 25 numbers. Let me double check and check on your list as well. Okay, and I do have 25 numbers. And the biggest thing about statistics is if you write one number wrong, it could affect the entire problem. So your detail, make sure you pay attention to that and you don't get anything mixed up, okay? But first of all, let's just make a table for this data set. We're going to call it a frequency distribution. So when I ask you to make a frequency distribution, no big deal, just make a table. Now, let's say that this represents number of siblings. And it can really represent anything, but let's say this list represents 25 people were surveyed. And this was the response they had for the number of siblings that they had, okay? Now, looking at the list in general, I can't tell any major features. I see some numbers repeat. I see one six, so if somebody had six siblings. I see, you know, cases of one, two, three, four, and five siblings, but I don't really know a pattern just yet. And I'm hoping the graph will tell me a pattern, okay? So I'm going to come over here and make a table. <coughs> And on my table, my left column is going to say number of siblings. So whatever your data set represents, you're going to title that column that value. So number of siblings, whatever the name is. Yep, and you're going to list out the answers. So here are all the answers that surveyed people gave. One sibling, two siblings, three siblings, etc. So you list them out, and you would want to list them in numerical order, too, because you want to make this table easy to read. So then what we're going to put next to it is how many times somebody said one sibling and how many times somebody said two siblings, okay? Cool. The fancy word for this is frequency. All, all that frequency means is a count or a total for that group. Whoever said one sibling, how many people said that? Whoever said two, how many people said that? And I'm going to list it out. <coughs> now, just so we don't get confused on the numbers and where they are, I'm just going to put some lines. But if you're on note paper, you don't need this, really. But look back at your data set and count how many times a one appeared. And actually occurred four times. Okay? And sometimes you may want to go through and kind of mark somehow what you've took off the list, you know, you kind of decide how you want to do that, but you want to keep a running count of how many times one happened. Okay, how many times did two happen? Seven. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? So, so far, that seems to be the most popular answer. Okay? About three siblings. 
six. Very good. So three siblings happen six times. How about four siblings? Three. Three times. Very good. Five siblings? And six siblings was two. Now, again, when I wrote the data set down, keep in mind I said I wanted to double check that I had 25 data values because that's how many I knew I had listed. I want to make sure I didn't leave anything out. Can you check this column and figure out 25 as well? Well, sure, you can add these numbers together. You see you have 25 items in your data set. Now, a typical variable name for this is N. Okay, go ahead and get used to that. N means how many items are in your data set. So go ahead and get used to calling N your total amount for your data set. But that's a frequency distribution. Nothing too hard about it. It's just a table. But what's the benefit of the table? Automatically, I can tell you the most popular answer was two siblings. What about the second most popular answer? Three. Three siblings. What was the least popular answer? Six. Six siblings. Okay. Is it that obvious in this list form? No. Not really. I mean, I can sit there and go through it and count. But if I had the table already, do I have to count this list? No. And I want you to think about everything that you do on a worksheet or a practice problem or even on a quiz or a test, that when you're doing this, you're doing this so that the reader can follow you very quickly. And they don't have to think about it. They can quickly say, oh, two siblings was the most popular. Okay? So you're trying to make it easy for the reader where they won't ask any questions whatsoever. Okay? So that's what a frequency distribution looks like. It's just a table. Now I'm going to erase the data set, but I'm going to leave the table up here because I don't need the data set anymore. Okay? What I want to do is to turn this data set into a picture. Okay? Now just to give you a quick idea of what kind of picture I'm talking about, there are several kinds. We're not going to draw this one in this course, but if you ever take another statistics course, you may talk about a bar graph. And notice that as I draw these bars, and I would label this graph and give a lot more detail, but you notice that the bars don't touch. Okay? That is for data that is words or colors or descriptions. Male, female, um, overage, underage type thing, you know, anything where it's definite categories. Colors of M&Ms, colors of Skittles, whatever you want. The kind of graph we're going to draw is what's called a histogram. Now, to give you a quick picture of a histogram, it's going to look very similar to a bar graph, except the bars are going to touch. And I'm trying to draw them about the same width. I'm not having real good luck on some of these, but they should all be the same width. So this one's a little too skinny. You can make that one a little bit bigger, a bit wider. Maybe that's a little bit too wide. But I want to have bars of the same width, and I want them to touch. The reason they touch is because this is for data values that are numerical, that you can put on a scale. So you'll put the 1 right next to a 2, right next to a 3, right next to a 4. Okay? That's one type of graph we're going to draw. And then the other type of graph that we're going to draw is called a frequency polygon. And you might be able to see the histogram on the back, but let me show you what's going to happen here. In fact, let me etch it very lightly. Frequency polygon comes from a histogram. In fact, let me change colors. On a frequency polygon, you would take each little bar at the top and the middle and put a dot. Okay. And then at the end, you put another little dot equally spaced away on the axis. And then at the end down here, you do the same thing, kind of equally space it away on the axis. Okay. The polygon part, because this tells you frequency, how high those dots are. The polygon part comes from connecting the dots. Like that. Okay. The reason we call it a polygon is a polygon means you have straight side segments. 
So I have a straight segment here, straight, straight. Try to draw little straight segments to connect each dot, but you just connect the dots, okay? But once you've drawn the histogram, the, poly, the frequency polygon will be just kind of finishing up on a second picture, showing you the same picture, just in a different form. Okay, so let's do a histogram first. How would I specifically, I know the bars have to touch, but how would I draw it for a table like this? You're going to have a vertical axis, and you're going to have a horizontal axis. On the horizontal axis, you're going to put your title of your first column, number of siblings. You have to tell someone what that axis represents. Okay? On the vertical axis, you will put frequency. So we're going to put frequency right here. And I want to put some numbers there as well. Now, the big thing I want to make sure you realize is, yes, you need words to describe each axis. Now you need numbers to set up a scale. Because I said this is going to be for numbers, uh, data that can be represented by numbers. Typically, I'll assume that this is a zero. And then I want to put a scale down here that covers these data values. Now, my scale can basically be units of one. You know, it's just one to six. So as long as I can mark off those numbers on my scale, you may have to extend it. Try to spread them out evenly. So if you have to adjust, go ahead and adjust. Label at least some of the tick marks. Now, what I mean by that is you can label by twos. Let me slide my title down below so you can see this better. You could label 2, 4, and 6. Or you can label all of them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It doesn't matter. Okay? Frequency, you have to also put a scale. Now, what do I mean by a scale? To make sure you're real clear on this because I've seen this mistake happen a lot. The numbers we see are 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7. And here's what I'll get. 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7. And they'll put a 2, and a 3, and a 4, and a 6, and a 7. That Yeah, you skipped a 5. What else did you skip? You skipped a 1. That's not a scale. Okay, so a scale is like a ruler. It has to have all the numbers up there. You may not use them all, but it has to have all of them up there. So when I change this, let me slide this over so I have some more room. I have to have a scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, and always make room, get everything up there, don't squeeze it in, seven. And don't forget, if you move something, go back and put it with your axis. So you need a word to describe it, you need a scale to describe it, okay? But once you've got this done, the rest of it is drawing bars. And you're going to draw a bar that makes a certain height. Well, do you have to go back through the data set anymore? No, you've already got it organized. So for this one, for one sibling, I'm going to draw a bar that's four units tall. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to center it over the ones. And so this little right line should be about halfway between one and two. But that way, if someone looks at it, they say, oh, okay, this is one sibling, and it's this tall, so four people said one sibling. Okay? Now, the next one, I want it to touch, so I'll just kind of extend it on up. It needs to go up seven, and I want it halfway between two and three. Try to draw as neat of a bar as you can. If you want to use a ruler, feel free. But you should be able to draw a very neat picture, make your bars touch. Uh, for three siblings, we need to go up as high as six, so something like this. Again, try to keep it as straight as possible. For four siblings, we should have a height of three. For five siblings, a height of three. And for six siblings, a height of two. 
If you want to go back and color in your ball, <coughs> feel free. <coughs> You want to make that stand out. But the next big thing, now that I've got it drawn, is to identify maybe the pattern of the bars. Do you see more or less of the data on the low end? More or less. And when I mean low end, like lower number of siblings, do you see more or less of the data there? More. You see more of it because the bars are taller. Do you see more or less of the data at the higher end? Because the bars are shorter. Less, you see less of the data. You see a high peak. You can instantly tell two was the most popular response. Obviously, three came in second. What was tied? Three. Four and five siblings. That answer was tied for three uh, answers each. And then we can tell the smallest bar. So we can kind of tell a little bit about the data set. Now, what would be a benefit of this instead of this? Well, imagine if this table had like 100 values, 100 different answers people gave. And it's not a sibling question. It could be, what's your grade on your test? Something like that. Would you want to look at a long table or would you rather look at a picture? A picture. I mean, people say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, there's a reason they say that. You can get information very quickly from a picture. Okay. You will be asked to draw a histogram. I will be looking for a name for each axis and a scale for each axis. Can you count by twos or by fives or by tens or hundreds if you need to? Sure. Just as long as it's an appropriate scale and it covers the numbers you need to show. Okay. <coughs> now from the histogram, we can draw the frequency polygon. And I'm going to get rid of the table now and I'll put it beside it. So you can see the similarity. <clears throat> I'm even going to try to draw them horizontal with each other. Put my scale back up here. And put my title for this axis. And then put my scale back up here. And label and put its title. And this is going to be my frequency polygon. And it's going to come from the same way that I did the histogram. I'm going to put some dots and I'm going to connect the dots. But the way I figure out the dots is by how tall each bar was. Now, the quickest thing to do, because you won't be drawing the frequency polygon on top of the histogram, but it comes from it, is just to notice that bar 1 was 4 units tall. So I'm going to go 1 and 4. It's kind of like I'm graphing back in the XY coordinate plane. What should I pair with the 2? Pair the two with the seven, so I'll put a dot up there. The three will get paired with a six, so I'll put a dot about right there. Four will get paired with a three. Five will get paired with a three. And six will get paired with a two. And then you're going to need to close off your polygon. So you're going to need to put a dot down here about halfway through if there was a 7 on the right-hand side, and then a dot down here about halfway through of where the 0 would be. And then connect your dots. And try to make your connection straight line segments, and you will see the shape again of your data set. This should tell you the same picture or the same information as a histogram. Notice you got a peak up here at the low end. You've got higher values down here, you know, higher points. So that means you have more of your data set down here, less of your data set over here. But doesn't that make sense for number of siblings? We don't have very many families who have a large number of siblings. 
six or less is probably a pretty typical number for number of siblings. Okay, there are exceptions to the rule, but in general, that's a pretty good idea of what you could expect. Okay, so a frequency distribution is just a table. A histogram is just a bar graph, but the bars touch. And a frequency polygon is basically connecting the dots, but each little dot is where you have the height of each little bar. Any questions so far? Okay, another kind of graph works very well for data sets that have numbers that involve like 25 or 32 or 68. Next kind of graph we're going to talk about is a stem and leaf plot. So let me give you a data set. And again, this data set could be anything, but the key I want you to notice is the fact that all my values will have two numbers, um, 25, 68, something like that. So two digits, a unit and a 10. 22, 53, check that you have 20 numbers when you've written it down. I've got 20 numbers and hopefully I didn't write anything down wrong. But I want to talk about how to organize this data set since you have a units and a tens position. Okay, A stem and leaf plot is a graph where you actually write out the data values. You'll see the actual numbers. But the way you're going to break it up is you're going to put the tens digits on the left. You're going to put all the ones digits on the right. But you're going to consolidate. You're not going to list every single tens digit as every time it happens. For example, um, the smallest thing I have for a tens digit would be a two, anything in the twins. So when I put a two here, this is technically what I'm calling my stem. What branches off of a two? What would be the leaves? Okay. I'm going to go through in order and just kind of mark off as I get to them. So hopefully you can follow what I'm doing. But 22, I'm going to put a 2 there. Now that's the 10s and that's the 1, so that reads as 22. The next one would be 29, so I'm going to put a 9 there. 29. Okay. The next one's a 27. What would I write here? A set. Good. 27. Okay. This next one, put a 5. 25. Well, well, hold on. There's a 23 in there. Yep, there's a 23. I don't want to forget that one. 23. Okay. And the only other one I have is a 27. Now you might say, well, do I write it again? How do I handle repeats? If I have 20 data items, so N is 20, I want to have 20 numbers over here. So do you think you write it? Yes. Yeah. So it's okay if it repeats. Don't worry about it. In fact, repeats are good because that's going to be a pattern that you're going to notice. Now, if that's the 20s, what should come next? Yeah, three for the 30s. So go through 
And it doesn't matter if you do it in the same order as someone else because we're going to reorganize this in just a minute. But just get all your 30s written down. So 35, 31, 31, 39, 33, and 39 again. Okay. Also, as you write these, be very conscious of your handwriting. Try to keep the first numbers all in one column. The second number is all in the same column. The third number is in the same column. Because I want to see which row is longer, which row is shorter. So I don't want to um, squeeze my numbers together. Spread them out evenly. Okay, next row should be something for the 40s. 45. 46. 47. 45. And another 45. And that's all I've got. So that's okay. All right, well, then I need to do the 50s. 53. 53. Put that down. 52. And a 52 and a 57. And that's it for the 50s. And then the 60s. 62. Let's see, 63 and 62. Another 62, okay, and a 65. And again, try to spread out your numbers evenly so that you can tell the first column, second column, third, and which row is longer, which row is shorter. Now, which row was longer? Okay, the twins. Now, what if I told you these were ages and these were employees? Okay. Which age group had the most ages? The twins. The twins. Which came in second highest? The 30s. Okay. Um, what was the highest age? 65. What was the lowest age? 22. Now, not only can you tell where more of the data is and where less of the data is, you can also tell what the data is. Okay, what each value would represent. Now, would this be my final answer? No. And I can still answer questions because it's a small enough data set, but what I would prefer before I even start asking questions is that you put these in numerical order. Okay, the stem is already in order. But now each row, you put each row in order. So here's my final answer. I'll make my stem. Two, three, four, five, and six. Those are going to be my each row. And then I'm going to put each row in numerical order. So I'm going to put a 2 and a 3, a 5, two sevens, and a 9. And then the next one, a 1, a 3, 5, and then two nines. This one's already in order. There's nothing to do because it's just two fives. Two three, seven, two, two, three, five. Good. Now, in this final answer form, it is terribly obvious 65 is your highest age. 22 is your youngest age. Which ages were repeated? 65. Let's start at the beginning. 27. 27. 39, 45, 45, 42, 62. Do you see how obvious that is? And imagine if you had 50 numbers over here, but if it was in order. The highest and the lowest stand out immediately, and anything that's repeated, they're going to be right next to each other. So that's why we want to see repeats, because that jumps out and tells us, oh, there's some people that were the same age. So we had two people who were 27. Okay? Now, Something else I can do with this graph going back to my table. I could do what's called a grouped frequency distribution. And when you see the word distribution, what does that just mean? It just means it's a table. So don't let it upset you that I say make a grouped frequency distribution. You're just going to make a table. And we're going to make a table for this data set. And if it's already in the stem and leaf form, this table is very easy. Okay? 
Notice how my table's going to look. And before I even put my titles here, I'm going to tell you what these rows are. And the first one is going to be 20 to 29. So anything in the 20s. And then 30 to 39 for anything in the 30s. 40 to 49. 50 to 59. And I need one more group, 60 to 69. So that's why I call it a grouped frequency distribution because I'm going to have all these different groups. Now, my numbers represent age. So what I could, and you can make up your own title here, but you got to have something. You could say like age groups. So if here's an age group of 20 to 29, age group of 30 to 39, etc. Now, it's a frequency distribution, so this one has to be frequency. How many were in each age group? <coughs> now, can't you count real fast? Isn't this a lot easier to count than looking through this list and marking things off as you go? Yeah. In the 20s, we had six people. Because I had a 22, a 23, a 25, a 27, a 27, a 29. How many are in the 30s? Okay. How many are in the 40s? How many are in the 50s? Three. And the 60s? Four. And if you add up this column, should you not, because we said there were 20 items in here, should you not get a total of 20? And what variable name can you call that one? Yeah. N. N. Good. Question? Do we have to put the N before or after or does it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter where you put the N. That's up to you. I'm just trying to get you to remember N for right now. Okay? Now, either one of these is going to be a lot easier to understand than a list of numbers. But now, either one of these is going to be a lot easier to understand than a list of numbers. But what else you can do if you could draw a histogram for a table before? Shouldn't you be able to draw a histogram for this one? And I'm going to erase some of the data because I don't need that now. I just want space on the board. Here's a histogram when you do groups. I need a name for each axis, so I need age group. And I need frequency. And what else do I need for each axis? I need numbers, but it's going to be on what kind of thing? It's going to be on a, a scale. I need a scale. Now, you might say, well, how do I do a scale when you do age groups like this? What we could do is say 10, 20, 30, spread them out evenly, 40, 50, 60, 70. Now, are you necessarily going to use the 10? No, but I want it for reference for the scale. So I don't want you to leave too much off the scale. And then the next thing I want to do is my frequency. Now, I need a scale that will cover those numbers. So how high do I have to go? I just have to go to 6. If you want to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you can. If you want to do 2, 4, 6, that's okay because you can estimate where 5, 3, and 1 would be. No big deal. That's your choice. Now, as far as drawing the bars, instead of centering them over a number, since I have a whole group, I'm going to draw the bar as wide from one group to the start of the next group. So for the 20 to 29, I'm going to start directly with the 20 and go up to 6. I'm going to go even with the 30 and go all the way up to 6. I'm going to draw a bar. The next bar will start at the same spot, but it only starts at 5, so I'm going to connect it like this. And so it looks like the bar is actually covering the group 20 to 29, 30 to 39. And also let me ask you this. Is it okay if I had wrote 20 to 30, 30 to 40 there? What would be wrong with that? 20 to 30, 30 to 40. Yeah, your 30s will be overlapping. You say, well, where do I put the 30? 
Do I put it in the first group or the second group? So when you make up your groups, you make it look like it's very clear. If you got 20 to 29, it goes in this group. 30 to 39, it goes in this group. When you draw the bars, that's understood. Okay? This bar starts over at 30, up to this one. When I draw the next one, it starts at 40, up to the next one. So 40 to 49 is only two units tall. 50 to 59 is a little bit taller. Let's see if I can make that look proper. Three units <coughs> tall. And 60 to 69 would be four units tall. And notice I'll end over here at the 70, but am I including 70 in that group? No. It's understood 70 would start the next group, but we don't have anybody in that age range. So I don't need that group. But a stem and leaf is very good or very um, helpful for data values that have two numbers, tens and ones. It's also good for things like decimal numbers, 1.3, 1.5, 2.4, 2.8, 2.9, 2.10. Where you could make a stem and put the one and the two there, and then anything that comes after the decimal, three and five, and that can be read as 1.3, 1.5, and then 2.4, 2.8. So, another good way to use a stem and leaf is if you have those decimal numbers. Okay? So, any questions on your graphs? So, when I grade a histogram, I'm grading that you labeled each scale with words and, or axis with words and then you put a scale on each axis, spread them out evenly, mark off at least some of the tick marks if not all. When you draw the bars, they will always touch for us. The only difference is you might have grouped versus ungrouped. Okay? Frequency polygon, that's a little connect the dots picture. And a stem and leaf which is good for numbers that have tens and ones, or numbers that have a digit dot another digit. Those are really good possible examples. And keep in mind, frequency distribution just means a table. Okay? Nothing scary about it, it's just a plain old table. And the whole point of all of this, so take a data set that looks like just a bunch of numbers, and make sense of it where someone can quickly answer questions. Okay? Um, one other quick thing. In the stem and leaf plot, you could see all the actual values. Do you see the data values in a grouped frequency distribution? Do you know what the actual ages were for this group? Not by the table. If you go back to the data set, then you do. But what if you don't have the data set? Could everybody have been 20 in this group? They could have. I mean, we don't know. We don't have that information. So this table leaves out the data items. The histograms leave out the data items. It just summarizes it as a group. The stem and leaf tells you each little item. Now, which would you prefer if you had a thousand data items and n was a thousand? Would you want to know every little data item or would you just want to know the overall shape? Probably just the overall shape. You wouldn't really care so much about the actual individual numbers because it's a thousand numbers. That's a lot to sort through. But you could probably use the shape a lot more than you could the actual data values. So keep in mind, I'm asking you to draw lots of different graphs, but it's because certain graphs show certain features. And depending on what your data set is, you may want to use a particular kind of graph suited for that. Okay? So any questions? Yes, ma'am. So we're going to have to pick out, like, you're going to give us some information. We're going to have to pick which graphs we can use. Actually, I'll tell you which graph to use. You won't have to pick, but in real life, you would pick. Okay? So I'll just get you to demonstrate that you can do all of them, and then later on you would pick which one applies. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, that ends it for lesson one.